Hey kids, Mr. Fly, hope you're well. Another month has flown by, time for another bike news. The uh, opportunity for you and I to go through uh, MCN for the last month, so the month of April 2019. If you're interested in what's been happening in the UK bike news for that period, stick around and stay tuned. Okay, so uh, I hope you had a good Easter weekend. If you're here in the UK, we had an absolutely blinding weekend in terms of weather. Great weather to get out on the bike, which I did lots of, and did a bit of flying, which was great, so absolutely superb. Hope wherever you are in the world, you had a uh, chance to get out on the bike as well. Anyway, uh, another four papers to go through as usual, and uh, I'm going to do this as a two-parter, so I'm going to do part one now, I'll post part two tomorrow, and at the end of part two, I'll also do some parish notices, letting you know what's coming up on the Missing to Fly in the next few weeks and months as well. So uh, if you're interested uh, in bike news from the UK, do stick around and stay tuned to the channel, because there's lots of it to come. All right, the first couple of pages then, or first couple of papers, Pop those over there. First one is this, and the first story that I've marked up to talk to you about is, if I can find it, here we go, lightning strikes again. Now, electric bikes, these always split opinions, don't they? And this is a bike called the Strike from a company called Lightning. Um, and this uh, this is an amazing looking bike. I mean, it does look like a conventional internal combustion engine bike, uh, which is something I have a bit of a beef with with electric bike manufacturers. I don't know why they don't make them look a bit different, a bit more futuristic, but maybe that'll come over time as we kind of get used to the idea of electric bikes. Uh, the thing with this one that makes it so special and why I want to point it out is its uh, range and its price. They're claiming a 100 mile range um, at a price of £9,895, which is an absolute bargain for an electric bike that looks this good and has a decent range. Uh, so far, the best electric bike I've come across uh, is the Zero DSR, uh, and that was something more closer to 15 grand, I think, and had a, like a 100 mile range. With this one, if you're willing to spend um, another two grand, 12 grand, uh, you can actually get 150 miles out of it. They give you a special battery or charger that allows you to do that. So, or both, 150 mile range would be really quite usable, wouldn't it? I mean, normally on uh, you know on my bikes, I get about 120 miles. Not my GS, but my uh, Street Triple and my Panigale. I get about 120 miles between fill up. So that would be real proper, real world uh, range, wouldn't it? Well, of course, the charging takes longer. Anyway, this one looks lovely. It's called the Lightning Strike, as I say. Um, I know uh, electric bikes do split opinions. I think. Uh, have a go, if you don't think they're for you, have a go on one before you cast aspersions because although I love internal combustion engines, I'll always have an internal combustion engine bike. Uh, I love the sound, I love the vibration, I love the mechanics of it. Uh, electric bikes just give you something else as well. They, they're just the sheer shove and thrust on an electric bike is something to behold. Uh, and they are they are great, great fun. There's no reason why they can't exist. You know, us enthusiast motorcyclists, there's no reason why you can't have an electric bike and a couple of internal combustion ones as well. Uh, you know, in our lifetime, not all internal combustion engines are gonna disappear. They're always gonna be around for sort of fans of motorcycling thing. Anyway, the Lightning Strike uh, looks great, 206 kilograms. That could change, I think, sort of acceptance of electric bikes, we'll see. Uh, at the moment, it's only available in the US, it turns out, um, and it says that uh, Lightning plans to expand into Europe later in the year, so we'll see uh, how they do. Let's hope they do expand into Europe and uh, see how they take off, but uh, that one looks really good to me. All right, second story that I've marked up here. In fact, there's a couple of stories on this page. First one is this, hand-built stunner. Now, this is uh, Alan Milliard. I don't know if you've come across him before, but he's, uh, he's an amazing uh, engineer. He makes all sorts of bikes. Uh, he's made things with massive airplane engines and stuff in the past. And in the last uh, few years, I've seen him in the press building more replicas. Uh, things like he, he made a Mike Halewood replica sports bike, the Ducati, for example, I think. Uh, or was it the Honda? Anyway, uh, what he's done now is this. It's a Velocet twin. Now, uh, I don't know much about uh, bikes of this era. This is a sort of 1920s, 30s bike. But it turns out Velocet didn't ever make a twin engine bike, uh, or sorry, twin cylinder bike. And this is what Alan Milliard uh, has tried to create here. This is the bike that he said, if Vel Velocet made a twin, this is what it'd be look, look like. And what he's done basically is taken uh, two engines, taken one of the cylinder off of a single cylinder engine, reversed it, and made this twin engine. Absolutely incredible looking thing. I mean, it looks entirely authentic. I tend to agree with him. If Velocet did make one, it probably would look like this. It's incredible. Uh, and even more incredible, it says here, it took him eight weeks to build the bike. Absolutely incredible. So it started off as a 350cc single. It's now a 700cc twin. It looks absolutely stonking. No idea how much of it is the original Velocet, how much of it he's made. Uh, but he is, as I say, a very creative fellow. It wouldn't surprise me he hasn't made the whole thing. So goodness knows not what it's worth. Not that he's saying that he's selling it. But uh, yeah, beautiful looking bike. Uh, it's got modern brakes and things as well. So it probably rides all right. I'd love to have a go on it. It's an absolute corker. So uh, thumbs up to Alan Milliard for that Velocet twin. It looks brilliant. 
Okay, uh, next story that uh, I'd sort of raise your attention here. New Tenere breaks the web. Now this is the uh, Yamaha 700 Tenere, a bike that I've talked about before here on Bike News. It's one I'm looking forward to riding. It looks very much like a Dakar type racer. I'm not sure, or bike, I'm not sure I actually like that sort of upright screen look, but um, I do think it's gonna be an absolutely uh, credible, proper real world adventure bike, i.e. this is a bike that you could probably take off road, down a green lane, whatever, and not be too worried about dropping it because of its sheer weight and its sheer uh, value, frankly, which is the issue with some of the more popular big adventure bikes. So looking forward to this one. But anyway, Yamaha uh, did a sort of a, a web offer where you could buy it for 300 pounds off, basically, if you bought it on the web. Uh, and this is what they're saying, it brought their, brought their um, website down, which is quite interesting. So 8399 on the road is what they were offering on the website if you ordered before July the 31st. Don't know if that offer's still going, I suspect they're probably all gone now, but uh, when it hits the streets in September, it will be 8699 plus on the road costs. And I think actually 8,700 pounds for a bike of that type, I think it's pretty good value anyway, but uh, yeah, certainly uh, it seemed to go well when they offered the 300 pounds off. But a uh, great looking bike. That's uh, looking forward to seeing how that operates in real life, as it were. All right, next one here. Oh, blog off. <laughs> now I've mentioned before, I'm blowing my own trumpet here, I've mentioned before that I get to write a little article in MCN once every month. I rotate with uh, three other vlogger types and uh, I, as I say, this is, the, um, this is the one that I've written recently. It's all about comparing uh, my other love, which is flying light aircraft, and the similarities I see between fly flying light aircraft and riding bikes, of which there are many. Surprise, surprise. Um, but anyway, I managed to get my own fizzog in this particular edition, so that's my face of glare. That's the old me, by the way, that's the fat me, uh, before I lost some weight. But anyway, really glad that I managed to get me, uh, me mug into MCN. So that's good. And my mate Keith's aeroplane, which is even better. Anyway, moving on. I uh, just thought I'd uh, mention that in passing. Next, Kawasaki ZX-10R got one track mind, question mark. Now this is a bike, one of the sports bikes, the current crop of big litre sports bike that I haven't actually ridden. I've ridden the, uh, most of them, but not the Kawasaki. I have a bit of trouble uh, borrowing Kawasaki's, unfortunately. It's quite difficult for me to do so, which is ironic, because their UK headquarters is literally seven miles away from where I sit, and they've told me that I can borrow bikes, but so far, they haven't made it happen for me, which is a bit of a shame. But uh, anyway, um, so I've not ridden this one, so I was very interested to read uh, what MCN had to say about it. So I'll whiz over to their verdict. And this is written by John Urry, one of my favourite reporters of theirs. Uh, he's ridden the bike and he basically concluded that actually it's a bit of a one-track pony and that if you want to go onto the track, it's absolutely fine. But uh, on the road, it's a bit of a beast, quite difficult to ride. Not great fun at slow speeds and quite uncomfortable is what he was saying. So if you're into your sports bikes, maybe this isn't one if you're planning to maybe ride on the road mainly. But if you're a track day wizard or you just want a track day bike, then perhaps it's worth looking at this. But overall, uh, John gave it three stars out of five. Uh, so not a, not a hugely uh, glowing review, I guess. Uh, but 15,199, I suppose, is um, quite a good price for the current crop of litre bikes. Uh, the issue I have with some of these Kawasaki's, a bit like with KTM, is that they don't look that great. Yeah, I buy bikes with my heart, and uh, a great deal of that is actually loving the way that a bike looks. And this one, although it doesn't look ugly, it doesn't look particularly amazing either. When you compare it with the likes of the Yamaha R1, or of course the Panigale, or indeed the new BMW S1000R. This just doesn't got the looks. And why do um, Kawasaki persist in always having the bikes in green? I know it's a branding thing, uh, and, and, and green is very much part of their brand, but I think that puts a lot of buyers, potential buyers, off the bikes. A bit like the orange thing does with KTM, I'm sure. I'm sure if they would just um, you know, bite the bullets, okay, green is gonna be our corporate color, but you can actually buy this in all these on all these color palettes, they get more customers. I think they're probably putting off a few people uh, because of that very thing. So I'm not intending to have a bit of a go at Kawasaki, but I'm interested to see what you think. Maybe you've got one of these bikes and you do ride it on the road, so that'd be interesting to hear how you get on with it. But uh, do you agree with me on the green thing that they should offer it in many more colors? I mean, occasionally you can get black ones and they do various specials, but uh, the persisting with green, for me, doesn't do them any favors, I don't think. Okay, last uh, story in this particular paper. Learn how to wheelie. <laughs> now this looks great fun. I, I can't wheelie. I've uh, I'm not really ever tried because I don't want to do it on the road, and that's why this is so good. This is a company uh, got a website called I Want to Wheelie.co.uk. I'm not sure where they're based. Oh, Finmere Aerodrome, actually, which isn't that far away from me. I've landed there myself a few times. So this is Dan Sutherland. Their report has gone there to learn how to wheelie, and seems to have done it quite successfully. I just think if you want to wheelie, this is the way to do it. Not on the road with some people that know what they're doing with a bike that is properly equipped two wheelie. So this machine here has got this very clever arrangement. I don't know if you can see on the back of the picture, it's got a couple of prongs dangling down. So if you if the bike is lifted up too much, uh, once these rods touch the ground, it cuts the ignition on the bike and it brings the front down again. So you're not going to fly yourself off the back of the box. You've got no danger there. And what better way to learn to wheelie but on somebody else's bike that's been a bit 
harden that for it rather than your own machine and risk dropping it. So if you want to learn that wheelie, thoroughly recommend you go and do it with somebody like them. There are other schools around apparently, um, but uh, it looks like a bit of a laugh to me and something I quite like to do, although uh, I very much don't, uh, I don't condone this sort of thing on the road. I think people that wheelie on the road are just being idiots, frankly, but there we go. Um, sorry to those that do it, but uh, I, I don't think it's something. I think it definitely should be confined to off-road. Anyway, so uh, go and get yourself a, a go on a wheelie course if you fancy doing that in a controlled, safe environment. All right, so that was the first paper. Uh, next one, let me just have a swig of water. Right, next paper in this uh, part one of the Bike News Review for uh, April 2019. Where is it? It's going to be Christmas. I, I read something the other day that somebody said it was only, uh, I don't know, what was it, 320 sleeps or something until Christmas. What's that about? Sorry about that, mention the C word. All right, next story here. This is incredible. Blood bikers snubbed. I don't know if you saw this, but I think it might have made the main um, news press as well, this one, because to me this just feels wrong. So this is the uh, Warwickshire and Solihull um, blood bike team uh, have been pushed aside, told they're not required anymore because the uh, local NHS have actually gone out to tender and they're going to pay for an external uh, third party company to do uh, their blood deliveries for them. Now there's always two sides to a story isn't there but on the surface of it this seems a bit unfair. These guys have been doing this I think for since 2012 and providing this blood bike service and now the uh, the team at that N particular NHS trust has said we're going to contract it out to uh, a private company called QE Facilities in a um, apparently a contract worth an estimated 14 million pounds. Now in the uh, NHS's defence, they have said that this contract isn't just about blood bikes, it's not just about this area, it covers a whole load of stuff, hence the 14 million quid I guess. Um, but it is rather um, sad, isn't it, and a shame that these guys that are giving up their own time and providing it by the NHS's own admission a great service, that up until now, are going to be basically cast aside not doing this anymore. I think blood bikes is a fantastic thing and uh, it's a real shame to see uh, that that's happened in this case. Let's hope that's not the case uh, for blood bikers all over the country. That is just a uh, such a shame, but there we go. It's um, it's rules and all that, and it apparently it's what the it's in line with public sector procurement regulations. We went out to tender, uh, and uh, various supplier days were held, and we told organisations of our requirements. And uh, QE facilities are the ones that won, which is such a shame. Anyway, what do you think of that? The blood bike is being snubbed, as uh, MCN put it. Okay, next story here. What do we got? Ah, Norton Gear up for Atlas. This is interesting. Now I love, let me preface what I'm about to say here with the fact that I love Norton bikes. Uh, I've never ridden one. I just love the idea of the, the old British marks coming back, which is why I love Triumph so much and why I'll always have one in the garage. I can't wait to ride a Norton at some point, point in the future if I can wangle it. Um, and of course they brought out the new Atlas bikes, the Ranger and, and Nomad, which I've talked about before. Sub 10K for the Nomad. Absolutely going to fly off the shelves. I think we saw it at the NEC show. They were taking orders then back in November. Here we are, what, six months later. Uh, and uh, and the bikes, well, I guess, aren't flying off the shelves just yet. And this is the problem I have with Norton is that they, they announced these bikes. We all get excited about them. You can put your deposits down, but you don't see the bike for absolutely ages. And they said they were going to get better at this. Um, but here we are. They're building a new factory extension so that they can build the Ranger and the Nomad. Now, this picture here was probably taken looking at the trees, uh, you know, in the depths of winter. And I'm sure the factories are far more advanced now. But at this point, it's just an empty shell. Not only have you got to build the factory, which maybe they've done by now, I don't know. But you've got to put all the plant in it. You've got to get all the production engineering in. You've got to run the testing and all that stuff. You've got to shake the thing down before you start making production bikes. I don't know, I mean, I'm not a motorcycle manufacturer, but I would have thought, looking at this here, there's at least another six months before that's knocking out Nomads and Rangers, at least. So add the six months to the six months since the bike show. If you put your deposit down back in November, you know, you maybe won't see your bike until this coming November, another six months. So I just think that's a bit of a poor show, which it pains me to say, because I say I'm a, I'm a massive Norton fan. I wish them all the best, and I hope this bike is going to really launch the company. I think it stands a good chance of doing so, because these bikes look great, and I look forward to reading some reviews on them, and maybe I'll get a go on one myself at some point. I'd love to have a go. But I reckon it's going to be a while before you can actually go and purchase one, uh, which is such a shame. But uh, anyway, the good news is uh, when they do get this new factory built, they're going to be making um, 5,000 units per year, which is uh, like a five-fold increase. They're knocking out 1,000 per year at the moment, I think, across the model range. So, uh, yeah, that's going to make it a much more... It's still not a volume manufacturer. I mean, that's small scale compared to the likes of Triumphs or Ducatis or whatever. But 5,000 bikes a year, that's, that, that's great news. So, you know, maybe we will start to see some Nortons on the road. That would be absolutely fantastic. Alrighty, next one here. Can't quite remember what I've uh, put here. Ah, yes, Real World Adventurers. This is one of these MCN 250 group tests and they put together two, in quotes, cheaper or better value uh, adventure type bikes. So they've got the Honda CB500X, I think more later, uh, which retails at 6069, against the uh, Benelli TRK502X. 
which retails at 5499, so 500 quid cheaper thereabouts. Um, and I have to say, the Benelli, which is, you know, on the surface of it, the brand is owned by an Italian manufacturer, of course, Benelli, Benelli having a great history of motorcycles, is now produced in China and owned by a Chinese manufacturer, although I think they're designed still in Italy. But the Benelli looks absolutely fantastic, doesn't it? It's got like a, I don't know, back end of a GS, front end of a Multistrada type of thing, and, uh, you know, a third of the price of either of those bikes. It looks absolutely stonking. The Honda, I'm sure, is a great bike. doesn't look quite as nice to me, but they've pitched these two together because they are A2 licensed friendly bikes. That means if you're not in the UK, uh, if you're not, I think it's over 23, and you haven't got a full bike license, you can ride these because they're less than 40-something horsepower. Anyway... 47 brake horsepower, in fact, is what the A2 license capture covers. So they put these two together on this 250 mile uh, test and come up with their conclusions, uh, which are basically uh, the Honda came out with four out of five stars and the Benelli came out with four out of five stars. Now, the first thing to say about that is, isn't that amazing that now a Chinese bike is getting the same rating as a, as a you know, Japanese bike manufacturer that is, you know, normally thought of as producing real high quality bikes, Honda there's no doubt, mate, reliable, high-quality bikes. So if the uh, if the Chinese-made Benelli is in the same league, that's absolutely amazing, isn't it? Now, to be fair, I've read the article, obviously. They do say there are one or two pieces about the Benelli that do look like it's not quite as uh, well-manufactured as the Honda. But overall, it's kind of a step change in manufacture as far as they're concerned. This is the first uh, bike I think I read that they've... Uh, the first Chinese-built bike that they've taken seriously uh, as a you know motorcycle in its own right. They're not just saying it's good for a Chinese bike. They're saying it's a, it's a good bike. And I, for one, really like the looks of it. I like to have a go on one. A lot of people have asked me when am I going to ride one. The issue is they're quite hard to get hold of. Um, if one did become available, I would love to ride it because I think it looks stonking. And again, at the you know that size engine um, puts out 47 brake horsepower, as I say, and it's a what 500 ish cc, a 499 cc parallel. That could be a really good real world bike. And again, a bike that you might actually be tempted to take off road on the trails. It's got knobbly tyres or semi knobbly tyres. Looks like it's off road capable. Be interested to see how it uh, stood up in the fullness of time, but uh, certainly looks great. I'm not saying that the Honda isn't a great bike either, um, but I certainly prefer the looks of the Benelli, but uh, again, haven't seen any on the roads yet. Alrighty, so uh, I think that's nearly. Oh no, we've got another one. Oh, Love it. Jumping the gun there, got another couple of stories to go. Three wheeler goes extra mile. The Yamaha Nikon, or Nikon, I think is actually what it's pronounced. They've come out now with a more uh, touring focused version called the Nikon GT. Uh, and it's given, well, what uh, MCM say, uh, Nike and GT gives its quirky three-wheeler new purpose, question mark. Basically bringing it, making it more of a touring type bike. It's got a bigger touring type screen. It's got panniers, albeit soft ones at the back. I have a general, a bit of an issue with the Nike. And I've not, again, I've not ridden one of these. I'd love to. Um, they've never appeared at my local Yamaha dealer who had promised me about a year ago that when one does, I can ride it. So I can only assume they haven't appeared yet. I think they they do these tours where you can go and ride a Nike, but they're not that widely available in dealers. I'm not quite sure. But I have a bit of an issue about, or a bit of a problem about who these are aimed at. I mean, everyone that's ridden them say they're absolutely brilliant, but the people I've... Uh, seen on YouTube or read the reviews of are all existing motorcyclists and I don't think any of them have said they would have one over a normal two-wheel bike. They've all said the front end, great grip, uh, amazing feeling, uh, great novelty factor, um, but actually would you buy one instead of a normal two-wheel bike? Why would you buy one instead of a two-wheel bike? I don't know. So although I'd love a go on one and I quite like the looks of it, I'm a little bit in two minds as to who it's for because it's obviously not for a new rider, the engine's too big, uh, and if you're an existing rider not quite sure why you'd go for this anyway, because it's quite wide, it's going to be difficult to filter on. Anyway, I sort of digress. I'm just not sure uh, where the Nikon's coming from. But uh, they've made it more touring focused, and if this bike is suited for anything, it's probably touring. Um, so I think it's a good move. Although I'm a little bit surprised, I've only put like um, semi-hard panniers on, not proper full massive panniers. I mean, with this... With the bike being so stable and so on, being a three-wheeler, you'd think they'd be able to stick some you know, big panniers on there and make it have a really good capacity, maybe a much bigger um, fuel tank, etc. Uh, but there we go. Um, it's, got a, it's also got a centre stand now, a standard. Um, uh, it's got uh, heated grips as well um, and a long-range fuel tank, 180-mile uh, range apparently, which doesn't seem that long a range, does it? But nonetheless, good moves if you want to use the bike for touring. So there we go, that's the uh, Nikon GT. All right, so to the final story of uh, part one of Bike News for this month is uh, this one. Let's get ready to scramble, uh, says Simon Ralph. Now, this is uh, the um, new Triumph 1200 Scrambler. This is the XE, 
uh, which is the long-term bike of Simon Ralph out of MCN. He's got this for a year to ride and really get to know it. Uh, and he's done his sort of first write-up on how he's been getting on with the bike, having now done, I don't know how many miles he's done actually, a few, uh, 600 miles covered in the first week of owning it, he says. Um, so he's saying that uh, the things that he really likes is the suspension. This has got the fancy suspension on it, this being the, um, the high end of the Scrambler, the XC being the, uh, well, not low end, but the slightly lesser bike in terms of bling, suspension, etc. Anyway, loves the suspension. He loves the uh, new TFT screen. Uh, I think the functionality of that sounds great. I'm not quite sure about the looks, but certainly it's an improvement over the old Triumph TFT, which I always describe as a bit of a Fisher-Price TFT, my least favourite of all the TFTs I've come across. But the new one looks like it might be a good one, so looking forward to riding some more with that. Because I'm actually going to be borrowing one of these bikes from Triumph later in the year. I'm going to, I've purposely asked not for the XE, the top of the line one, but the XC, um, because I haven't seen any reviews of that. So I've, I have ridden the XE and I loved it. It's a lovely bike, very tall though. The XC a little bit lower, not quite so expensive. So I'm going to live with that bike for a few weeks and see how I get on with it. And I'll bring you my reviews, of course, as normal. So if you're interested in the uh, new Triumph Scrambler 1200, stick around, stay tuned to the channel. I'll be bringing you loads more on this towards the end of the year. I think I've got it in... Uh, I think I've got it in August, so I probably won't be bringing you the, the actual reviews until September or October time. So, but, but I'm really looking forward to it because I love the scrambler genre, as I've said before. So anyway, um, he likes that stuff. The stuff he doesn't like uh, are the tyres. Apparently he went on the press launch of this bike, which was somewhere hot and lovely apparently, and it had different bikes on the press launch. It had uh, Pirelli Scorpion Rally tyres then, which are much more off-road focused. Uh, and it's got different tyres on the actual production bike, which he said he didn't like very much. Rings of doom when it comes to off-road, he's saying. Uh, so there we go. So yeah, it's uh, the bike. Da, 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 da. Yeah, he's got, um, what's he got here? Oh no, he was told that when he wanted to try and get the Pirelli Scorpion Rally tyres, he couldn't actually have them fitted because they didn't make them for that size, which is bizarre, isn't it? But there we go. Anyway, so, uh, but overall, he's loving the bike and I'll see if I can curl with him once I get my hands on one later on in the year. All right, so that's uh, that's it for part one of uh, Bike News. As I say, it's always a two-parter from now on. I'll be posting the second part of Bike News tomorrow, so uh, do out check out the channel tomorrow where I'll be bringing you uh, another two newspapers and I'll be uh, giving you some news about what's coming up on the Missenden Flyer. All right, so until then, uh, have a good evening and uh, look forward to speaking to you soon. Till then, this has been the Missenden Flyer. Cheerio.